Yeah, and everybody with a big fat mouth said amen. Hey, at least you're willing to admit it, right? That's the first step. Hey, I want to introduce myself. My name is Josh. If we've not met before, welcome to Evangel. Uh, Grateful that you're here. And uh, we are in a series right now called My Big Fat Mouth. And uh, our big fat mouths get all of us in trouble in one way or another. And uh, we talked about one way last week. We're going to talk about a different way this week. And then uh, we're going to talk about criticizing and gossip in the weeks ahead. But today I want to talk about a topic that's going to hit way too close to home for every one of us. And uh, it's the topic of complaining. Yeah, I know, right? You didn't have to write this message and deal with yourself while you're writing it. But I, I know that, I know you're thinking, you're thinking, man, Pastor Josh, you're a real piece of work to talk about complaining in the midst of our present circumstances, uh, because if you didn't have anything to complain about like six months ago, there's been plenty of things to complain about in the last few months, uh, but the Bible is really clear on what it says about complaining, no matter the season of life or the situation that you're in, and really even the results of complaining in your relationships are pretty clear as well, and uh, compelling. They're, they give us reason to want to change and maybe use different words. Many of us have the problem of complaining. Many of us would deny that we have the problem of complaining. (laughs) If you ask people, man, do you complain? They're like, no, I don't really complain. And then the person sitting next to them in church on July 12th goes, you too have a problem with complaining. Uh, But really, every one of us at one time or another uh, can get into complaining. It's really an easy thing to do. Complaining is when you're talking about things that you don't want rather than saying what you do want. Isn't it a lot easier to express what you don't like, what you don't want, what you didn't respect about something than it is to be a person who walks in the room and brings solutions rather than problems? Right? You can find a hundred people who will walk into the room and tell you all the things that are wrong, uh, but it takes somebody different to walk in and say, hey, I have solutions for the things that are wrong. And man, that's just a little pro, tri- pro tip. If you want to be successful in your workplace, be somebody who doesn't just bring problems, but you bring solutions as well. A complaint uh, is when we want to change the person we're talking about. A complaint is when we want our situation changed. Listen, if you're berating another person or you're lamenting your own circumstances, you're complaining. And we live in a world where berating one another is like something that we do all the time. It's something that you hear all the time. It seems totally acceptable to just go on attack on another person. But remember, the gospel calls us to love one another. It calls us to speak life. It calls us to encourage each other. Uh, It's pretty easy to lament your circumstances. If something doesn't go your way, or you're disappointed in something that turned out, or you feel like you're in a place where there's a lot of things up in the air, it's easy to give way to complaining. I just want to be clear, not everything that we talk about that's negative is a complaint. There are moments where it's okay to fulfill the responsibility of expressing a concern. Like if you take your complaint to somebody with the authority to change the thing that you're talking about, that's not complaining, that's raising a concern, that's addressing an issue. But when you go to somebody who has no no power to change your situation and you just vent, because venting is now socially acceptable, if you, you just vent to them, you just complain to them, or if you and your boss sit around and complain with everybody you work with, that even though you're going to somebody in authority, you're not making change, you're just complaining. And uh, I had a pastor walk in my office one day and he said, Pastor Josh, I got to talk to you about something. And 
I don't really want to bring it up. I don't want to, and this person's not a complainer, and so, but I just feel like you need to know, but I don't know, maybe just like very apologetic, and they brought up an issue to me, and it was definitely an issue that I did need to know about, and uh, it was appropriate for them to bring up that concern, and so I don't want you to just think anything I say that's negative is a complaint, because that's not always true. It really depends on the motive of your heart, and it depends on the person that you're talking to. And so in talking about complaining, if uh, for many of us, if I was to hold up my Bible and say, tell me a story about somebody you complained uh, in the Bible, for many people, the same group of people uh, would come to mind. And that group of people, ironically, is known as God's people in Scripture. Uh, if you look at the Israelites wandering around the wilderness, they had just been set free from extreme bondage and slavery and persecution in Egypt, the most powerful kingdom in the world, with the most powerful ruler in the world, and God miraculously sets them free. They take what it should have been maybe a few days or a few weeks journey to the promised land, and they begin complaining, and it ends up taking them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to get to the place called the Promised Land or Canaan that God had prepared for them. It's ironic that these are the people who we most identify complaining with in the Bible because they had also seen the greatest work of God. Right? They, had, they had seen God do incredible things on their behalf. And it's a warning or, or even a caution to those of us that follow Jesus because you can follow Christ and still be a first-class complainer. And it doesn't automatically just mean that you don't complain. The, the worst complainers that we see in Scripture, or one of them, were God's people. They had seen God deliver them out of Egypt, and not just in the way of like, hey, I'm here, let's go. But through miraculous signs and wonders and plagues, God delivered his people with his mighty hand. He parted the sea so they could cross over as they wandered in the wilderness. He rained down manna from heaven. He brought in droves of quail that they could eat. He brought water out of a rock to provide for them. He did all these things. Later on, they would have victories over uh, major armies in these military conflicts that they had. They would see the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, and still they found something to complain about. No matter how much good has happened in your life, it is possible to find something to complain about. Here's what they said, and, and catch their tone of voice here in Exodus 14. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness, Moses. Come on, can you hear it? When my kids get that voice, we have this song we sing called, I'm allergic to griping, and I start sneezing. <laughs> but really, it sounds like a group of people who have a bad case of what I call faithfulness forgetfulness. They very quickly forgot what God had just done for them. And in the midst of their temporary difficulty, their temporary trial, they forget about the faithfulness of God, and they focus in on their lack of comfort. They focus in on their complaints, and really, this is what they would become no known for. That whole time in the wilderness, they'd become known for their complaining. And listen, you get what you focus on, right? It's, it's easy to find things to complain about, and it's, it's the person who says, you know what, I've dated five different guys, and all men are jerks. You know what, the next guy you date, you know what you're going to look for and identify any little iota of him that is a jerk, you're going to get what you're looking for. It's the person who says, man, I'm going to hate going to church. I don't like going to church. Church is boring. That guy just talks and talks and talks and he wears skinny jeans and I don't even like church. If, if that's your attitude, then you're not going to have much respect for me or for what God might want to speak to you in church. And for the record, while we're on the topic, <laughs> I wear skinny jeans because they fit chicken legs, okay? So... <laughs> I know other people wear them to be trendy and whatever, but I wear them because they fit. So that's what I've come here to tell you today. <laughs> but come on, when you, when you complain, complaining begets 
complaining. Why? Because misery loves company and there's something in us that just loves being able to whine and moan and complain about whatever is going on in our life. And, and the Israelites, for them, it was, we're going to die in the wilderness. We came all the way out here for God to kill us. He brought us through all that stuff so we would die in the wilderness and never see the promise of God. And because they looked for it and they saw it, do you know what happened? A generation of them died in the wilderness. Because they looked for it, because they complained, they actually saw it take place in their lives. And then Moses stands up in Exodus 16, 8, and he talks to the people, and he really gives kind of the mic drop moment, and he says, your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. And in almost every one of our situations, your grumbling is not against your pastor, it's not against your church, it's not against your doctor, it's not against your spouse, your grumbling is against the Lord. The Lord, by the way, who delivered Israel out of Egypt and has delivered every one of us out of our personal Egypt, our personal bondage and slavery. What, what would that change in our lives if I thought, man, every time I complain, God views it as me grumbling against him? And here's why we do it. We grumble against God because when a difficult situation comes our way, we take our eyes off, the, off of the God who delivered us out of Egypt, off of the God who has provided for us, out of the God who parted the waters, out of the God who uh, delivered us out of our sin. And we take our eyes and we put them on the smallness of ourselves. And we kind of, we take the deity of God and we lower it down and then we raise up our own humanity and we try to make a way for ourselves. And then we complain. Because you are not meant for the seat of Lord of your life and provider of your life. We take our eyes off of the goodness and the blessings of God and we put our eyes on the smallness of ourselves and so we forget the one who has delivered us and so we complain. But again, like it always does, the Bible calls us to live differently. In Philippians 2, Paul writes to the church in Philippi and in verse 14, he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Everybody say all. Do all things without grumbling. That's a really high benchmark. He could have said do some things or do the easy things without grumbling, but he says there is a way to do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may become blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Listen, when you woke up today, you began to make decisions that have created the day that you're living in. And, and I'm, I want to talk about the power of your thoughts and the power of your habits, but uh, don't get me wrong. I know there's a humanity side of this, of, of how to build and create a right kind of thinking, but I also know there's the spirit side where the Bible says the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And, and it's both of those. But let me just focus on this one side for a moment. In fact, I woke up today and I, I said, I, I said, Jeanette, I, I feel like good. I feel like I got one foot forward today, like I'm, I'm ready to go. I, I did some things last night that set me up for a successful day. And I found with, my, with myself, if I go to bed and I like lay out my clothes and have things ready, I get up in the morning feeling more organized and ready to go. And so last night I did all the things. Like I had a prayer time, I brushed my teeth, and I flossed. Yep, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I washed my face. I moisturize my face because I'm going to be 35 and there's some wrinkles that are happening. And, and I made sure my kids were tucked in. I checked the garage. I set the alarm. I made sure everything was ready to go. And I woke up today like in a different kind of world. Like I was ready to go. I wasn't stressed out. And I got ready and came to church. And I thought, man, I'm living in the fruit of what I created last night. And that's just one night, right? But the decisions that you make and the lines of thinking that you follow in your mind are creating the world that you're living in. When the Israelites decided, we're just going to complain and we're going to moan and we're going to speak against Moses and we might even kill him, they were creating the world that they were actually living in. But the Bible calls us to do this, to control your mind in order to recreate your life, to let your mind be governed by the Spirit. A guy by, Jam by the name of James Allen said this, he said, you are today where your thoughts have brought you. And you will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. If you want to change your life, change your mind. 
Change what you're allowing yourself to dwell on. Change the words that you're speaking. It's one thing to say, yeah, that's, that's, that message hits home. I want to stop complaining. It's another thing to say, you know what? I'm going to choose words that recreate my world and my perspective. And if I'm honest, I think a lot of times in the church world, we kind of go, God, change it. God, do it. Lord, I need a miracle. And we take zero self-discipline to actually make it happen. And what if God is doing all the work and giving us the power to do it, but we're never actually implementing what he's doing in our lives? And so if you want to recreate the way you're thinking and the words that you're speaking, then it has to start by the words uh, that you say, that you have to make a decision to stop complaining. I, I don't know about you, but over the last couple of months, there's been a phrase that I've just not loved hearing, and it's, it's this. Everybody get used to the new normal. And I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus, if I hear one more person tell me to live in the new normal, I'm going to crack. <laughs> like, and I just didn't want to hear it. Why? Partially because I just want the old normal back, please. I don't want new. It was fine how it was. I know some of you are adventurous and like try new things. Not me. Stable. Like keep it, keep it going. Like I don't need a new normal. But I, I, as I was researching this topic, I found that new normal is actually good for us. Because one of the best ways to develop adaptability to the stress of your life is to view your stressors as normal. What does that mean? To say, you know what, the world has changed, but this is now my portion. This is what life is going to look like, and I, I can adapt to this season. I can still be effective in this season. And I'm going to show you a story of a guy from the Bible, the Apostle Paul, and how he did this in a very real way in his situation. If you want to recreate your world, you have to recreate the way that you think. I love what Helen Keller said. Somebody, if anybody was going to say they're a victim or had a difficult life, it, it could be somebody like her. And Helen Keller said it this way. She said, when one door of happiness closes, come on, this is going to set somebody free today because you're going to need to hear this. When one door of happiness closes, another opens, but often we look so long at the closed door that we don't see the one that is open for us. We get so stuck on what God didn't do or how he didn't come through or the door that didn't open and we stare at that door and try to figure out how to pry that door open and friends, I'm not preaching at you. I got a situation in my mind I'm thinking about right now. I'm preaching to myself. We stare so long at that door that we miss the door over here that God has opened for us. This is where complaining takes us off track. Instead of actually doing something real about the issue that we're facing, we complain and we feel like we're getting something done when we're actually accomplishing nothing. And we're actually missing the new door <clears throat> that God might be opening for us. Craig Rochelle says it this way. He says, if you can change your circumstance, do something about it. Like there's some of you that that video started playing and it says, my boss is terrible, and I don't know why our staff here has been singing that all week. They like, they like the tune, I think. Uh, <laughs> but maybe you're like, yeah, my boss is terrible. You know what? You can change your situation. So rather than complaining, if you have the power to change your circumstance, do something about it. Not complaining, but do something actual about it. Change your situation. If you can't change your circumstance then change your perspective. Then take on a different perspective. And again, I'm going to show you this in just a moment. How do we actually stop complaining? I know that part of it is a work of the Spirit, God making us more like Christ, but I think there's a, another practical side of steps we can actually take to go from complaining to actually being somebody who gives God our praise. Here's what I've been really disturbed about as I've been preaching all morning today. It's this question in the back of my mind. If God knows my voice, is he more familiar with my complaints or with my praise? Is he more familiar with the things even that I pray about that really I'm complaining about? Or is he familiar with the sound of my voice when I'm praising him and thanking him and exalting him in my life? Because man, that bothers me deep in my core that the God of all creation who knew me in my mother's womb, who, who formed me perfectly, who wrote a destiny that he has for my life, who, who plans my coming and my going, that he hears more of my complaints than my praise? 
That the God who formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into man, that now what mankind returns back to God is complaining. Sorry, maybe that doesn't hit you, but that just floors me. And that makes me want to get on my knees and say, I'm sorry, Jesus. Like, help me see the world different. Help me to just think different and approach life different. How do we actually make it so that our praise comes first rather than our complaining? The first step is that you need to identify how much you complain. Come on, now nobody's signing up for that, right? (laughs) You need to identify how much you actually complain. Because the reality is many of us live in an unconscious incompetence. What does that mean? We complain all the time and we don't even know it. We don't even realize we're complaining, but if you would nudge somebody next to you and say, hey, do I complain a lot? The answer would surprise you or maybe hurt your feelings. There's actually a book called A Complaint-Free World written by Will Bowen, and he says, put a, a rubber band on your wrist, and every time you catch yourself complaining, move the rubber band to the opposite wrist, and see if you can go 21 days without moving the rubber band. He says, most people think, no problem, like I can go at least a day, and he said, then they break it within the first week (laughs) from moving the rubber band so much. We live in kind of an unconscious incompetence, not really understanding how much we're complaining. And if you don't understand the issue or you don't really own it, you can't change it. See, people complain without even knowing that they're complaining, it, and it, it's so pervasive in our society. You can't really turn on any talk radio, or you can't look on social media without, without a, just a culture of complaining surrounding us. And so we all think that we don't really even have a problem, but the Bible still says do all things without grumbling. I heard this story of Uh, a husband and a wife who laid down to go to sleep one night, and as they were laying there, she began to talk about her day, and and man, she just went on this complaining streak about her work and her job, and she was going and going and going and going, and I know, listen, I know women get the, like, the raw end of the deal in that we say women complain too much. Guys, you complain just as much, you just do it in your head. Like, it's no different. (laughs) Just because they're saying it doesn't make them worse. (laughs) But but she was going on and on and on and on and on about this situation. And her husband, you know, inside his little thermostat was going off. And and he was like, I'm so tired of hearing this complaining. I can't even handle it. And all of a sudden, he sat up straight in bed. And he goes, oh my goodness, would you please shut your mouth, you? And then he said all these really not nice things. Now listen, I'm not recommending that. And I also like to say, I'm not the husband in this story. (laughs) But in that moment, she kind of like woke up and said, whoa, I didn't even realize the stuff I was saying was setting you off. I didn't even realize that how much I was complaining. And in that moment, when it at least got addressed, it moved her from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, where she could say, okay, now I realize I have an issue. Now I realize that I was rambling on and on and on, complaining about this situation and that wasn't right. And when you get to that point, you may be a little embarrassed about how much you complain. You may be uncomfortable realizing how much you complain, but at least now you're conscious of it so you can change it. And, and so then, so ask somebody around you, put the rubber band on your wrist. Stop listening to people who are chronic complainers because friends, honestly, if you're surrounded by people who complain and you say, I don't, I don't complain, I just listen, no, Complaining begets complaining. So either you're a part of it and you don't realize it, or you will become a part of it. Because it's it's a seed that you sow that will grow in your life. To get out of incompetence, you have to realize how much you're complaining. And once you've identified how much you complain, then you can actually start to change it. So number two is control how much you complain. Identify how much you can you complain and then start to control it. Now listen, my journey. This message was very convicting for me to write. Um, I remember going through a season where I was super sarcastic. I'm still a little sarcastic. I found out today after confessing. Now I'm catching myself. Uh, But I was really sarcastic. But it wasn't just like sarcastic joking. It was sarcastic as a cover-up for hurt. Or sarcastic as a passive way of cutting at people rather than speaking the truth in love. And I really came to a point where I said, man, I can't like out of this mouth, salt water and fresh water, they both can't flow out. So it's going to have to be one or the other. And if I want to be somebody who truly speaks the truth in love and people can trust what I say, I can't be so sarcastic. And I had to make a decision and I became 
conscious of my incompetence and, and had to take some steps and be accountable to actually change the words that were coming out of my mouth. I developed an awareness of what I was saying. We become more careful with the words that we utter. We actually become slow to speak and quick to listen. Like it's still a really good idea before you speak to stop and think about what you're going to say. Like I know that's second grade stuff, but it's important for adults to hear it's okay to not get an email that makes you terribly mad and, re- and send another email back in the next 10 minutes. That's not even wise. Like, be competent about the things that you're saying. And we can do this because Paul is the one who wrote in Philippians to do all things without grumbling. And right after that, in Philippians 2.17, look what he says. He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering uh, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Now, I'm not going to get into everything that that verse means, but look at the beginning. I'm poured out as a drink offering, and at the end, I'm glad and rejoice. Paul is in a place that he always wanted to go to when he wrote this letter. He finally gets to go to Rome. He had wanted to go to Rome. Like most of his ministry, you can read about it. And he finally gets there. And once he's there, he's arrested. He's placed under Roman guard. He's chained, shackled to a Roman guard for eight-hour shifts. And he's sitting in a jail cell. Think about that. He finally goes to the place that he wants to go. And now he's sitting in a Roman cell knowing that at any moment he may be killed for his faith. And still he writes, even though my life is literally being poured out as a drink offering, I am glad. And I rejoice. That is somebody who's not a victim to their situation, does not just follow their thoughts wherever they take them, but is consciously competent about what they're thinking. Is consciously competent about the decisions that they're going to make. See, and here's the reason, and if you don't get anything else today, get this. The reason Paul was honestly able to live this way is because he understood, even if I'm sitting in a Roman jail cell, it's okay. Why? Because my story is not about me. You will complain if you are the center of your story. But Paul understood that his life was about more than himself. And he made Jesus the center of his story. And so in doing so, he took his eyes off of himself and he put them on the goodness of God. And that changed his perspective. And I'm going to show you what that means in just a second. See, if you can change your circumstance, do something about it. If you can't change your circumstance, change your perspective and really ask yourself this question. What if Jesus is really at the center of my story? What, in the middle, what, about, what if in the middle of the thing that I feel shackled to right now, I stop looking at myself being the center of that story and start saying, what is God trying to teach me? through this story. What is God trying to work out in me right now? God, what, what, why am I walking through this? What if we actually stop looking at ourselves and the smallness of our own strength, the smallness of our own ability, and we actually lift our eyes again and say, God works together all things for those who love him. And Just as a side note, God working together all things for your good does not mean that you get everything you want. God working all things together for your good means that your life is used in a way that affects the kingdom of God. What if we take our eyes off of ourselves and put Jesus in the center of the story? If you'll intentionally not complain, that will cause you to unintentionally not complain. You will actually be able to come to a place where you don't have to think about it anymore, where the words that come out of your mouth will be, it's like the, the writer of, in, in the Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. And letting that just be second nature, rather than second nature being complaining or second nature being gossiping, it's a second nature that says, Jesus is at the center of my story. I can do all things without complaining. I I even say the right words, the right thoughts, and not even needing to think about it. I just simply speak what is right. If, If that can happen in your life, you know what else will happen? The people around you will start to be changed. 
It won't just be that, that God did a work in you and your thoughts and your attitudes changed, but you'll find that the people even around you are happier, that the people around you will notice that you don't complain as much anymore, that the rising tide of your life will raise all the ships in the harbor, and you can positively influence your workplace, you can positively influence your church, you can positively influence your marriage and your family when you make a decision to say, I want to get to unconscious competence where I don't complain and I don't even have to think about not complaining. There's a, an amazing thing that happens in a grape vineyard where one grape decides that it's time to ripen. And the grape decides that it's time to ripen because there's an enzyme or a hormone within that grape that begins to shoot up in production. This, this enzyme is called ethylene. And when, when ethylene rises up in that grape, that one grape not only uh, increases with ethylene within, but it also begins to secrete ethylene to the grapes around it. And it's literally that one grape saying, everybody, it's time to change. And in the vineyard, all of a sudden, the grapes from that point out begin to ripen all across the vineyard. Because the one grape signaled to the other grapes that it's time to change, that it's time to ripen. Man, if you can read the Bible and tell me that God can't use one person, we see it over and over and over. If one person in a family, if one person in a marriage, if one person will make the decision to be the ethylene and say, you know what, it's time to change. We're going to do things differently. I'm going to raise the consciousness of the people around me, not by what I say, but by the way that I live, then it can change a lot of people and a lot of hearts. And I'm going to close by showing you exactly how in Philippians 1, here's the reason that Paul writes the book of Philippians 12, 12 lines in to his letter to the church. Look what he says. He says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Come on, they, the church would have got that letter and they would have said, we know Paul's in prison, we know that life isn't good for him. They opened that letter and he could have said something like, I want you to know that what has happened to me really stinks. I want you to know that what's happened to me has really discouraged me. I want you to know that's what happened to me is stopping everything Jesus wants to do. Come on, can't you put yourself in a, in a global pandemic situation and just see the difference here? Because you can look at the world right now and say, man, things are going so well and then this. Things are going so well and then that. If just this would happen. But Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Here's the ethylene in Paul's letter. He says, you can complain about what's going on around you, but what I'm telling you, what this grape is saying, is no matter what I walk through, God can use it for his good. No matter what this situation looks like of me sitting in prison, the gospel is still going forward. No matter how uncomfortable I am and how, how much I'd rather be doing other things, the ultimate reason for me being on this earth is still happening. My life is still being poured out. It's like he says, you know what, friends, I want you to know something. I'm not the prisoner here. You want to know who's a prisoner? It's the Roman guard that has to be chained to me for eight hours while I preach about Jesus. <laughs> That's what he did. Every time a new guard was shackled up to him, they heard the whole story of Jesus for eight hours. That's a captive audience if I've ever heard of one. And the Bible says that Paul used that situation to glorify God in such a way that the whole imperial guard knew about his walk with Christ. And the nation of Rome was literally beginning to be changed changed from chains <laughs> from somebody locked in a jail cell he says I'm not a prisoner I'm positioned for strategic influence 
Oh, come on, friend. If God would only just wake up our hearts right now and say the thing that you're walking through is not meant to take you out. The thing that you're walking through is meant for you to see my glory. The thing that you're walking through is meant to open up your eyes to what I'm able to do. The thing that you're walking through is to advance the gospel of Jesus. Will you get out of the muck of your complaints, out of your short-sightedness, and would you put it at my feet so that I can advance, so that I can use it for greater good than you ever could? Come on, anybody can lie down and die, friends. Anybody can lay down and say it's over. But we're people of faith, and that means the Bible says don't shrink back and be destroyed. Step forward in faith. Believe me. Trust me. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. That's Psalm 37. I'm going to preach it every week because it's working itself out in my life right now. See, you will see what you're looking for. And if you want to keep your eyes on yourself, then that's what you'll see. But if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, if you'll look for the goodness of God in your situation. Man, I wasn't even going to tell this story, but I have a friend who lost a kid. And to me, as a young father, that's like the worst thing you could ever go through. I can't imagine anything worse. I said, how'd you make it through? And he said, I pulled up to the hospital and my pastor pulled up right next to me and I knew God was in my situation. And come on, if you can walk through that and you can see Jesus in that situation, you can see Jesus in anything. And I'm praying that God would give you the, the fortitude and the strength and the wisdom and the open eyes to see him working even in the place where you're hurt the most, even in the place where you feel like you've been victimized that you'd put your eyes on him and instead of being moved to complain, that you'd be moved to praise him. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. So what are you chained to right now? What's the thing that has y'all locked up in your head, freaked out, trying to handle it in your own strength? Who's the person that you're chained to right now? And if you can change your circumstances, then do something about it. But if you can't, then change your perspective and say, the same God who's worked all things together up to this point is working it out now. And I'm going to remind myself of his faithfulness rather than having faithfulness, forgetfulness. Amen? Amen? Come on, would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? <clears throat> Jesus said, thank you for your church, for your people. Lord, your word says, do all things without grumbling, not because they're children of Evangel or children of Pastor Josh, but because they're innocent and blameless children of God. Come on, friend, if you're with me, would you just pray this way? Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Lord, change my heart, change my mind, change my words. Friend, if you're here today and you're not serving Jesus, you've had a relationship with him, but you've walked away from it or you've never had a relationship with him, the Bible simply says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and that name is Jesus. It says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If that's you and you need to pray that way today, I'm going to pray and you just model a prayer personally, just somewhat after this one. Father, you're the God who saves. And I've missed the mark, so I ask that you come and save me. I confess that Jesus is who he said he was. He's fully God, fully man. He came, he died, and he rose again. God, I believe today. Even if you have some unbelief, God, help me with that, but I believe. And so I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name. Why don't you stand with us and sing and declare all these things that we've talked about?